Hey everyone, it's Ross, and in today's video, I want to talk about a visit that I had with my buddy Mario. Um, he grows figs up in Connecticut, and he grows a lot of them, and he grows a, a, a probably probably one of the most impressive collections of figs I've ever seen. Um, it's not necessarily the the varieties that he has; it's it's more about the presentation and how everything's laid out and just how professional it looks I mean he's got the whole thing down to a science right it's an operation it's it's something to see it really is uh, if you know Mario you can certainly attest and if you do know Mario because I know there's a couple of you guys out there who uh, who know who know Mario personally and have been to his house you know let us know down in the comments just how impressive Mario's place is um, you know and I want to kind of walk you guys through that show you a couple photos he didn't want to get filmed back in October I don't blame him but um, I did get to take a lot of photos it was a really long day um, you know it's quite sunny I had a lot of wine um, I was a bit out of sorts by the end of it and I couldn't really um, get a chance to really even take a lot of video there was a lot of um, a lot of things happening that day it was a really long day so I kinda got what I could get and that's why I'm doing this now and talking about Mario at this point of the year um, but I was also just kinda reminded because we we sent each other a couple texts today and I was reminded of some of the things that I saw at Mario's place were just incredible um, he also works with an experimental station up in Connecticut that uh, they grow figs at the experimental station to trial all different types of things to learn as much as they can to spread that on to uh, local farmers or even just farmers in you know the Northeast um, that's kind of their goal is to figure out what will really do well in this climate and how to make this work for somebody who doesn't have a, um, a greenhouse you know can it be done in a in a zone six climate in Connecticut as an example um, Mario really does have in my opinion probably the best operation I've ever seen uh, it really is done professionally I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed by the whole thing and um, let's just let's just walk you guys through this real quick uh, so this is his like his greenhouse that that was a greenhouse his neighbor complained um, because it was too large of a structure and then the the um, the local government kind of uh, forced him to take down the top half of the greenhouse it was an incredible structure I've seen pictures of it and they never got a chance to finish it because of the neighbor but they took the top half off of it and then covered the whole exterior of it with netting which will prevent any um, any birds from getting in um, the whole thing is just I mean there's so many f like fine details to the whole greenhouse that just blew me away like uh, just incredible I mean you can't I can't even really remember all of them that's how in insane the whole thing was it's really a large structure and this this photo doesn't do the greenhouse justice he has about let's see one two three four five he's got about five or six even seven rows I'm, I'm not even 100 percent sure he's got a lot of rows of potted figs but also he has a row of in-ground figs that he um kind of buries them quite deep in the ground in very small slits of concrete uh he was a builder by uh profession i believe that was one of his professions and he really knows his stuff uh, about concrete and he's able to really create the that thermal mass that he wants with this concrete so by growing in them in these little slits in the concrete um, he kind of grows them horizontally in a Japanese espalier which is you know basically he grows them out sideways and then from those sideways canes goes up all these vertical shoots and that's kind of what he prunes it to and he protects that right he covers that that vertical cane here and because it's so low to the ground it's very easy to protect has a lot of heat from the um, the concrete you know he throws over some nice insulation he's even got really nice um, tracking like he knows what the temperature is outside at any given moment 
and he knows what the temperature is underneath that insulation in the greenhouse. It's um, I mean the the extents that he's gone to is is, is nuts. Uh, but his potted figs are all in large size pots, um, all varieties that have most of them have originated from Italy, and they're all really interesting little weird special figs uh, that he's been trialing down these rows. And the coolest part about it, because he's got so much thermal mass, even the fact that he's in uh, a pretty cool place. I mean, Connecticut, I think he'll tell you that he's in zone 7, but I don't think he's technically in zone 7. It gets below zero there. Or maybe he says he's in zone 6, I'm not sure. But to put it lightly, I think he's in a much colder place than I am. Uh, certainly with a, a much shorter season, at least two weeks uh, maybe even three weeks to a month. I think he's certainly in a much uh, shorter season than I am. And somehow he's able to get these incredible figs to ripen in time. And I think a lot of that has to do with a couple things that you can you can kind of see in the greenhouse here. He's got a lot of heat. He's got them in full sun. It's in sun all day. Uh, from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. I mean, it doesn't stop for the most part. I mean, he's cut down some uh, some trees in the background here, I believe he told me. But essentially, he's getting full sun and then some, right? He's getting probably at least 12 hours, I believe. And all that heat throughout the day really kickstarts these plants into gear, gets them really going. He also gets impressive fruit quality that way. Because of all that heat, um, they ripen a lot quicker. Even in cooler temperatures, it's just so much warmer there. Um, he really has set up pretty much a nice microclimate that he's essentially created with all this concrete, um, the full sun. I mean, it's just, it really is impressive. And down each individual row, he's got this little cart that he brings down. And this, I thought, was the most impressive thing. You can see the cart here. Along the cart is a scale. He's got some pens. He's got some... Uh, um, well, he's got his phone with him, but on every fig that he picks, he'll take it off the tree, put it on the cart, weigh it, take a photo of it. Um, he'll mark down on these tags, which we'll get to in a second, some additional information. And then he puts them underneath the cart in a basket. Um, he also has a trash can attached to the uh, cart if he has to throw some figs away or throw whatever it is that he needs to throw away. The place is spotless, right? He picks up all the leaves. He makes sure the trees are pruned properly. He doesn't let any suckers go. I mean, every single tree is spotless, right? He's got them all pruned the exact way you need to prune them as single stem trees with the appropriate number of branches. They got perfect form. Um, he is very meticulous with this. And because of that, he has the success that he has, right? He's able to have, you know, probably I think 200 to 300 trees or whatever it is um, in his on his greenhouse there. And he's able to maintain them at a high level, which is really impressive. But that's what he does, right? He'll take the fig off of there, take a picture of it on the scale, and record all this data right then and there. And the other thing I want to mention is that we go down to these tags here, that's, which I found to be quite impressive. Uh, these are vinyl blinds, like the vertical vinyl blinds that really make a whole lot of noise when you close them and open them. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about? They're really popular uh, back in like the 90s. They're, I mean, they're even still popular today. They're basically shades for your windows, but really long ones that people use maybe for, you know, um, I guess you guys know what I'm talking about. but. Essentially, that's what this material is. He made a, a little hole in it so that he can hang it from the tree. And he's cut that blind into different sections, which are then his tags that he uses on his trees. And I believe he has two tags per tree um, so that if one goes missing or if uh, one is, you know, whatever happens to it, he has a backup. But the one tag is specifically for recording data and you can see here he's got on this tag a whole bunch of different data and this is one thing that I'm really going to be paying attention to and we're really going to be upping our game with this year 
um, because it's not it's you know it's it's uh, it's not too difficult I think for me to memorize all this stuff you guys may think oh wow Ross has 160 or whatever how many varieties I have it's hard to keep track of all that right but if you spend enough time with them it's not but at the same time it would be nice to have all that data on the tag so what he does is he actually uses pencil and it lasts an entire season no problem um, and he just has that pencil on them on the cart with him at all times and records the data so he'll uh, have the the variety name up here this is the number that it is in his collection number 200 this is the name seventh street unknown and then he records the first fig of the year as an example um, and if I go to the next photo here he has a, a uh, I think the other side of it is for Brabas and the other side is for the main crop so you can see here he's got the show date which is when the figs started they originally showed up on the plant and then when they got ripe so if we go back to this photo here this is when the figs first showed up in his on his plant here on the seventh street unknown and then this is when they ripened for the first time and then this here is a tally of the amount of figs he got up until this point so at October as an example I forget the exact date I visited him as it was uh, like the first weekend in October um, you know he had at this point 13 figs off of that tree um, he makes some special notes down in here and says okay just any additional notes his one note was that it's very small this here I forget what this is this is something in particular if somebody knows what this is let me know down in the comments but this particular thing here it actually means something I believe um, but you can see here Brabas if they were aborted um, when they showed when they were ripe any additional notes again the variety the number that it is and then when the when the actual plant started waking up and showing leaves right that's also very important and it's the same thing here right so this I think is really really impressive that he's keeping track of all this because I can kind of get a nice picture in my mind but there's nothing like having hard evidence and then at the end of the year he collects all these tags right because he's already got one on the plant that has the variety name but he'll take off that second tag bring that in the house and then put that into a spreadsheet and he keeps track of all this for years <laughs> right and then this helps him make decisions on what he should keep and what he shouldn't now if we go to my spreadsheet which I've actually deleted a lot of stuff out of here on my list but I've gone to similar steps to try to keep track of certain things particularly the variety name the source um, over here is the source we also have if it's on a rootstock what size pot it's in you know I'm sure Mario keeps track of all this as well in a spreadsheet um, but then I'm also up in the game right I'm gonna up the game we're gonna do the bud break the date in which that the tree woke up that way you guys know did it get an early head start what time did it wake up and then that way we know from the time it woke up to the time it was dormant exactly how many figs were ripe so that's why we have this column here how many were ripe how many got spoiled whether they were molded they fermented they were ruined by uh, by the fruit fly SWD or if they were ruined in the rain and then we'll get to see how many are left on the tree at the end of the season so that way we get a really good representation of what happened to this tree this year right we're also gonna keep track of when I pinched the tree when the uh, the main crop formed when the Braba formed I'm sorry when the Braba was ripe and when the main crop was ripe and then we're also gonna keep track of when the last main crop was ripe so we've got uh, the first main crop and then the last main crop and this will give us a nice little window of exactly how many days we need to figure out of how much time we need for this particular fig to get ripe in uh, in my climate and we can then apply this we can then put this into another spreadsheet that my buddy Ram has set up 
or ROM, but ROM has set up a nice little spreadsheet for growing degree days for those of you guys who know that what that is. And he set up a nice little spreadsheet that people have put in there, their location, how many growing degree days that they get at their location, and then how many days it took for that fig to ripen, and then essentially how many growing degree days that it, it needs to ripen. So by doing that, we've actually put, to, he's put together a really nice list of varieties and how many days those varieties require uh, to get ripe, which is really, really cool. Um, so we're going to keep track of all this. We've also got the taste rating here that we've had for for a couple years now. And we've also had the notes here that we've had for a couple years now. We'll add things as time goes on. Notes will be adjusted. Um, you know, this will eventually be a nice little compiled spreadsheet that I hope to have for years, years of data that you guys can look back on and uh, really see what's going on with the varieties that I'm growing. And this will also help me because at the end of this year, this upcoming growing season, at the end of that, we're going to be making some really hard decisions. We're going to be getting rid of a lot of varieties. And this is certainly um, the best way to make a really well-informed decision. Now, a couple other things with Mario's um, place here. We're going to go through this uh, fairly quickly here. I don't particularly know why I took a picture of this this fig, but I got it. Um, this here is the the dead pile. This is the pile of trees that Mario has killed and doesn't want anymore, um, and he doesn't think anybody should have. So that's why he hasn't divvied them up to people. Um, he has basically chopped them back and tried to kill them and left them out to die. Um, this is a nice wine that he treated my uh, my girlfriend and I to that I was really happy to try. It was incredibly good. This is the first really exceptional bottle of wine I've ever had that really opened my eyes to what a real wine should taste like. Um, I really recommend a Barbaresco. Um, what's the other one? Um, it's another Italian wine that Mario really recommends. But... Uh, if you guys haven't really had an exceptional wine, I really suggest you find one. Um, you don't always have to pay an insane price for them, but to get a wine of this caliber, I think you do. Um, I have found a $20-ish bottle of wine that my uncle has recommended uh, that is incredible. Uh, and it's only 20 bucks, So it doesn't necessarily beat this. Uh, it's this this wines in its own little world guys but it certainly comes close and I'm really impressed and I'm uh, it's something that if you can't afford it it's a nice little alternative um, so you can find them out there this here is the experimental station that we went to and this is the last thing I kind of want to touch on um, like I said at this experimental station they're growing a number of varieties I think this one's here is uh, Grease de St. Jean, if I'm not mistaken. They also have Osborne Prolific. I believe they have Bataglia in here. And they're all growing them in these pots under a hoop house that is completely enclosed. Very warm in there. Very, um, uh, very, very warm in there. To the point where the figs get to a real exceptional quality. You can really see... They have them on, on drip irrigation, and that's it. They completely control the water. You can really get some incredible quality figs in an environment like this. Um, this will certainly rival something like California. Um, here's a really great example. This is Osborne Prolific that we found on some of the trees in there um, that were really starting to shrivel up, get that nice cracking. This one was really dry, like pretty much a dried fig at this point. Um, it's it's actually incredible that we even got to taste these because these trees at this point in the season have been pretty much abandoned and not really cared for at this point. A lot of the SWD had come in and really infested a lot of the figs that were on the trees, that were remaining on these trees. Uh, but this Osborne Prolific completely blew me away. This one tastes a lot like dates and raisins and had a really exceptional dried fruit quality to it um i really like this fig dried it's certainly a nine out of ten for me 
I can't say that it's a 10, but it is something that for those of you guys who live in a dry place might want to consider growing because this one is very different. It's not your typical fig and uh, when it's dried like this, it's just, it's just nuts. I mean, it really is quite an exceptional fig. Here's some more photos of the, the trees in that experimental station. Um, you can really see that they have some pretty wild growth to them. They really need to be cared for, I think, more meticulously than they have. But overall, they're doing really great stuff. You can see here how this irrigation system is kind of set up, covering the top with black plastic. I wonder what plastic that this is here. This looks like, like heavy-duty stuff. I'm going to be doing this as well this year, is covering the tops and even the sides of most of my pots, if they're not already black or they're a fabric pot, I'm going to be covering the sides. And uh, all of them I'll be covering the tops. I wonder what this plastic is. It looks like maybe a pond liner or something like that. And you can see here that they're growing them in sips. And they irrigate the bottom of the sip. They, uh, Like we've talked about in past videos, guys, you kind of have a, a reservoir of water down in the bottom of the sip. And the tree eventually drinks from that and it kind of, um, what's the word? It kind of moves, the water eventually moves its way up into the pot so that there's even moisture um, at all times. As long as there's moisture at the bottom in the reservoir. Um, here it is actually sub-irrigation pots that they're talking about. And here's the variety. So Verte, Canadria, Battaglia, Neri, and Osborne Prolific. So... Pretty cool trees. Um, really cool to see something like this in person. You can see up here they have some fans that were blowing. Um, this is something they use to move these large pots around. This is a real heavy duty um, pot mover. And they sell these for like 400, 500 bucks at different, um, you know, like nursery supply places. Like AM Leo, I believe, sells, I think, this exact one. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, this is how they move these things around and, and eventually put them into storage um, And that's pretty much it guys that is the end of the visit with Mario is really incredible uh, visit I got to see so many interesting things that I, I Really couldn't I really do I couldn't believe how uh, incredible the setup was not only at Mario's place, but also what they were doing at the experimental station is really nice to see that people are doing this um, as serious as they are. So I am going to be personally trying to match Mario and step up my game as much as possible. And that's what we're going to be doing this year with the tags, covering the pots. Um, you know, we've already got as much concrete as we can. Um, yeah, man, there's so many things. He's growing a lot of them against the house. I didn't really get to show you guys that, but he's got a whole section of trees that he just puts out in the yard to see what the, what'll happen to them. He calls that the graveyard, I believe, or maybe this, maybe this is the graveyard. I can't remember, but then he's also got some trees along the side of his house, the side of his sunroom, and that heat from the sunroom combined with the the heat from the wall really provides a nice thermal mass. He also uh, does some covering and he covers those and those are right up against the house and they're also in just planted in these small slits of concrete and because they're in these small slits of concrete they uh, they don't disturb that concrete believe it or not and um, all that concrete on the ground the brick from the wall of his house the heat from the sunroom is just giving him so much heat and these figs are able to perform at such an incredible uh, incredible rate. And you know what? I've talked a lot about this, guys, is that if you can't protect your figs, at least give them a lot of heat, right? And that we're trialing with all kinds of different methods that I'm doing to see if we can get our trees to survive the winter through various methods. But in the end, if they don't survive, we need to figure out a way to get them to fruit for us that year and get them to thrive and not just survive so that's really the biggest lesson I think of this whole 
trip to Mario is that we need to be getting our, our trees to thrive as much as possible, as much heat as possible, as much sunlight as possible, and we'll be really happy and rolling in the figs. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching this one. Um, and, yeah, I'll, I'll catch you all tomorrow for the next video. All right? Take care.